Hello, my name is Greg Coolgan, and I'm an architect with the Apogee team at Google Cloud. I'm very excited to be here today with my friend and colleague, Deborah Elkin, who will join us a little later on to give us an amazing demo of some of this functionality that we talk about today. So let's get into it. I'm not going to read this agenda slide, but there's a key takeaway. How you can use Anthos and Apogee as a means for deploying secure ABIs while allowing developers to focus on delivering business value. Let's set this up just a little bit. At my company, there's an app innovation day. I built a killer app. Jellybean Auto Count. We all want to win Jellybean guessing contests. The app I built utilized some sick machine learning models to quickly and accurately provide a count of the jelly beans in any jar just by processing a photo. Everyone agreed that this app was amazing and we needed to make it available to all our employees. I've got this great code, but how should I deploy it? I went to my colleague Maria, as I knew she was a wizard on our ops team. Maria said, I have just the thing. We've been doing Kubernetes for a while now and had learned that it was difficult to manage multiple clusters, particularly across different regions. There was a new technology that the company was trying called Anthos GKE. It promised to simplify management of Kubernetes creating a consistent experience for developers while doing so securely. It sounded fantastic to me, so we went ahead and deployed my app to Kubernetes. My app was pretty basic, but outside of following secure coding practices, I didn't have to concern myself with security, scaling, etc. People loved the app. Usage was through the roof. I used this as an opportunity to recruit some team members. We were getting lots of enhancement requests and began working through the backlog. Since our architecture was based on microservices, we saw a proliferation of services. We quickly realized that we needed a way to help us manage and secure all of these services. Back to Maria. Maria had an answer again. There's a reason I keep going to her. In this case, we can use a service mesh to help us secure the services, understand the interactions, and help us generally manage the traffic. The great news is that we have a fully managed service mesh offering already available as part of Anthos called Anthos Service Mesh. This was again, a great relief as we had enough backlog to get through without worrying about managing all of the TLS and certificates and access control and routing and just all of that junk. As you can see, we simply layered in Anthos Service Mesh and kept going on our merry way. With just a little help from us, the operators on Maria's team added all of the policies into the Anthos Service Mesh to secure the communication between all of our services. All of a sudden, other teams in the enterprise caught wind and wanted access to these services we were building. Before now, it was just a couple of us and we all worked very closely together. We wanted to let other teams use our services, but we didn't want to take a bunch of our time onboarding these teams. Back to Maria. I'm sure no one is surprised to learn that she had another solution, this time Apogee Hybrid. It runs on top of Anthos GKE and the runtime can be co-located with our services. It provides a way for us to make our documentation discoverable and allow internal teams to gain access to our APIs via self-service. No need to talk to anyone on my team. So as you can see, we layered an app G to help manage these APIs that we were exposing to other teams. More success. At this point, Teresa, one of the execs took notice. She saw the popularity of this app and knew we had to make it available to external developers. Turns out we already had all of the pieces in place to make that happen. We simply needed to add a few more Apogee capabilities, such as threat protection, rate limiting, and OIDC. We also needed to ensure that we could handle the load. We simply deployed another cluster of GKE and Apogee Hybrid and GCP to ensure that we could scale. So that's all great. But as I stated, I'm just a developer that wants to deliver business value. I know anything about exposing APIs to third parties. How can this be made as simple as possible for me? With that, I'm gonna turn things over to Deborah to walk us through how we, might how we might be able to enable someone like me. Thanks, Greg. Let's explore this with a demo. In the demo, we will see how we can leverage CI CD pipelines to make it very easy to expose services through secure APIs. It is standard practice when working with services to use CI CD pipelines to automatically build and deploy whenever changes are committed. This not only increases developer productivity and software quality, but also makes it easy to ensure best practices are followed when developing services. In the demo, the CI CD pipeline is governed by Cloud Build. When new code is checked into a repository managed by Cloud Source repositories, 
cloud build triggers a new build. This will generate a con new container image, check it into cloud container registry, and deploy this container into a service cluster. We can use a similar approach for making it very easy to build an API to front a service. When the service developer tags the source code, Cloud Builder will orchestrate the generation of a new API proxy and deploy it to an Apigee hybrid runtime. Cloud Builder will test the API is successfully working and check the newly ge generated API configuration back into Cloud Source repository. Even without having a deep knowledge of API development, a service developer can easily generate an API that incorporates the best practices adopted by the company. Once the API is deployed, clients can access this API. All external access is mediated by Apigee, providing a secure layer and eliminating the need to expose the service cluster externally. The demo we are going to see is from the point of view of a service developer well-versed in software development, but not necessarily an expert in API management. Cloud Source Repository is used for code source control. Typically, the developer will also use a local editor on their workstation to work on the source code, check to their local repository, and push the changes to the remote repository. Cloud Container Registry is used to store all the container images that are generated during the development process. The services are deployed to an Anthos ASM cluster. In this case, it is a development cluster. Additionally, there's another GKE cluster in which an instance of Apigee Hybrid Runtime has been deployed. Let's have a look in Cloud Source Repository. In mature teams, the structure of the repository is generated automatically when the project is created, and it follows templates that encourage best practices in software development. It even enforces them sometimes. A very common practice is to have CI-CD pipelines, that is, continuous integration, continuous development pipelines, that are triggered when code is checked. The pipeline triggers the build of a new container image and deployment of this newly built image into a service cluster. Let's see this in action. The developer will work on their local visual editor. They will make changes to their code. And once they're ready, they will commit it to their local repository. They will then push those changes to the remote repository. When the changes reach the remote repository, a new build is started. This is managed by Cloud Build. Let's have a look at what happens during the build. The first step builds the new container image. It then pushes it to container registry. After that, it is deployed to the Anthos cluster. The last step verifies that all the artifacts have been deployed and that they are successfully working. Let's go back to cloud source repositories and have a look in more detail at to the structure of the repository. We can see that there is an API folder. In there, there is a readme file that explains these steps necessary to expose this service as an Apigee API. Namely, we need to provide a couple of API configuration data and also tag the repository. That's all the developer needs to know in order to expose the service as an API. The developer decides to go ahead and do this. So once again, we switch to the local editor and edit the configuration for the API. We need to provide a proxy base path. This is where the API will be reachable. And we also need to provide the backend it will be connected to, in our case, our Hello World service. 
once again, the developer commits their changes. pushes the changes to the remote repository. Creates a new tag. And finally pushes the changes, including the new tag, to the remote repository. Once again, this triggers another pipeline that's managed by Cloud Build. This pipeline, in its first step, generates an RPG API proxy based on a template. It then deploys this API into the RPG environment and also generates all the associated artifacts required for the API to run. It also shows a API key that is required in order to test this API. The next step tests that the API has been successfully deployed. It actually invokes a couple of very simple requests, one without an API key and the other one with an API key. The next few steps check the code generated for the API back into the source code repository. It is worth mentioning that the API that's generated incorporates all the best practices that a centralized API team deem as necessary. For instance, verifying API keys, checking for threads, etc. Typically, this centralized API team will be in charge of managing the templates used and will continually update them with best practices as their security posture changes. Let's now take a look under the hood and explore what the API does. For that, we will switch to the RPG user interface. When we look at the API proxies that have been defined, we can see that now we have a new one related to our hello service. When we look into the details of the proxy, we can see that it is connected to our hello service, which is available on the hello endpoint in the Anthos cluster ingress. Let's have a look at the policies implemented by the, this proxy. Remember that these have all been auto generated. So first, it will add a correlation ID to the request if one doesn't exist. If one exists, it'll just make sure to remember it so that it can inject it back in, in the response. It will then apply some threat protection policies to ensure that no attacks are sent in the headers, for instance. It will then verify that an API key is provided and that it is valid. It will then enforce quota limits on the number of calls. And finally, we'll apply JSON threat protection policies on the payload of the API. If all the checks pass successfully, it will forward the request to our Hello World service. On the way back, it will inject a correlation ID if the Hello World service didn't preserve the one that was sent in the request. Let's now see the API in action. In order to do that, we will start a very handy feature that Apigee has that allows you to trace every request that comes into the API proxy. For that, we'll use some pre-prepared requests that we have. The first one sends a request without an API key. As expected, we get a 401 unauthorized response because there was no API key included in the request. Our second test doesn't include an API key either, but it does include a malicious header. Let's test it out. As expected, we get an error because it, the API has detected a threat in one of the headers. Our next test, it's a valid request. It is a request that does include an API key. As expected, we get a successful response. And by the way, this is the new version of the service 
that was deployed at the beginning of the demo. It also includes, includes a correlation ID that was automatically generated because our request didn't include one. Our next test does include a correlation ID in the request. When we execute it, we can see that the response does include that correlation ID played back. Let's now send a few more requests. If we send them in quick succession, we will at some point hit a quarter limit, and that's when the API will return an error. Let's see how Apigee handled all of these requests. The first one, it's the one that returned a 401. That's when we didn't have an API key. The verify API key policy failed in this case and stopped any further processing. The second case, it's when the threat protections failed. Again, all further processing is stopped. The next few requests are the ones that were successful. We can see that all of the policies were successfully executed and then the request was sent to the target server. When the response was received, it was forwarded back to the client, invoking the API, including the newly generated correlation ID. The last request, it's the one that failed because we had exceeded our quota limit. And again, any further processing was stopped. In this demo, we have seen modern software development practices that are commonly adopted by the developer community when building services, such as CI CD. And we have also seen how we can leverage these practices to easily solve the problem of exposing these services to external consumers in a secure way. The service developer does not need to be an API guru in order to build APIs that incorporate all of the required best practices. I hope you have enjoyed the demo. Thank you for watching it. Thanks, Deborah. That all made good sense, and I think it's something even I can understand. But I have a question. When do you generally see customers set something like this up? Well, generally customers with larger enterprises and mature programs are the ones who set this up in order to enable a truly federated model. By that, I mean a model in which API creation is not concentrated in a small team of API experts, but rather distributed all along the developer community. OK, got it. But we all know that security requirements are going to evolve, sometimes quite quickly. How do teams manage the security of their APIs across these distributed areas? That's when we generally see a centralized team that is responsible not just for the creation of these automated templates, but also of the shared flows that they use. With a shared flow, you can build reusable units of logic that are invoked by the APIs. In mature organizations, security measures are normally implemented using shared flows. If the centralized team sees the need to update some of these security measures, they will update the shared flow. All APIs making use of this shared flow will automatically apply the latest and greatest security measures. Yeah, OK. I think that's a good plan. So with that, I think it's time to wrap up. Today, we talked about how you can use Anthos and Apigee Hybrid together to secure APIs. With Deborah's demo, you could see how easy it was for a developer to expose an API using best practices set up for them by an API Center for Enablement or similar team allowing the developer to concentrate on delivering business value. I want to thank you for watching this session and offer to continue the conversation. Both Deborah and I have set up some expert one-on-one -on -one sessions over the next couple of weeks. We will also be answering your questions in the question and answer section for this session.